Jesus Christ our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you will continue to be with us as we go forward in this portion of the service, Lord, when we get into the Word of God. Father, I'm asking that the Word will be planted deep into the hearts of your people and that they will be able to get greater understanding as to the many different things that take place in the body of Christ, the different positions, Lord God, that you have placed, the different gifts that you have given, Lord God. And so, Father, I'm asking right now that I decrease in your Holy Spirit increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Uh, welcome anybody that may be tuning in on this Sunday evening, or this Sunday afternoon, rather, uh, to our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, today I'm going to uh, do the introduction for the five-fold ministry gifts. Amen. Hallelujah. We have been teaching on the gifts of the Spirit for some time now. I have covered the gifts in Romans. I've covered the gifts in Corinthians. Yes. And so now I'm going to cover the gifts found in Ephesians. Amen. And the Word of God in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, you don't have to turn there, but it says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get what? Understanding. Understanding. And understanding is defined as a mental grasp. It is defined as comprehension. Understanding is the knowledge and ability to judge a particular subject or situation. There is a great, say great. great. There's a great need in the body of Christ to have an understanding of the fivefold ministry gifts, also known as the ascension gifts. Because there's a bunch of mess in the kingdom. Yes, it is. Uh -oh. yes, it is. There's a bunch of mess that's in the kingdom. Yes, we have individuals that hold particular offices and they don't even know what they are, but yet they're claiming to be this or that. Mm -hmm. You got those that sit in the pew and don't know if somebody is genuine or not because they are unlearned about these particular gifts. So it is important, I'm telling you, I have never seen such a day and age in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ, where people are title hungry. Just title hungry. The bottom line is God may use you to operate in more than one gift. Amen? And one thing about it, you don't have to label every single gift. I mean, sometimes, you know, we may say, I'm Dr. Apostle, uh, Evangelist, all this other stuff. Come on now. <laughs> we got to ask ourselves, is all that necessary? But it's the stuff that you actually see. So people are really confused about who's who and what's what. Then you have individuals that don't hold the title that feel like maybe something wrong with them because they don't have a title. You need to have a greater understanding. So we're going to get into this teaching, and I pray that each and every one of you will have a greater understanding once we conclude it. And so as I said, when it comes down to it, people in the pews are not clear, and some are confused, and some individuals professing to operate as particular gifts are not clear, and some are also confused. And so therefore, it is my desire to bring such clarity to the body of Christ, not just nothing but the truth ministries, but to the body of Christ as to what the functions of the fivefold ministry gifts are, as well as the purpose for them. When you think about the word purpose, purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. God had a reason for giving the fivefold ministry gifts to the body of Christ. Turn your Bibles, if you can, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I just want us to look at verse 11, but you can keep your Bible open to Ephesians because we're going to look at it more in detail. But I, as of now, I just want us to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. If you're there, say amen. 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 All right, Ephesians chapter 4 actually lists the fivefold ministry gifts. Amen. And verse 11 says, And he himself gave some to be what? Apostles. Some. Prophets. Some. Evangelists. And some. Pastors and teachers. Amen. And so when you look at this particular passage of scripture, 
the he in the verse refers to Christ Jesus. Amen? The key word is some. Say some. some. Every single believer does not hold one of these offices. And so you got to understand that we're all in the body of Christ, but everybody is not going to operate in these particular offices listed here in Ephesians chapter 4, 11. But what you have to remember is that there are some gifts that every single believer possesses. As a believer, there are certain gifts on the inside of you. You are not without gifts. And when we look at the gifts in Romans chapter 12, the motivational gifts, one of the things that I said is every believer has at least one of these gifts, if not more. Amen? And when I talk about those gifts, I'm talking about prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, which some call administration, or mercy, which some of us call compassion. So guess what? If you are a child of God, you have one of these gifts. And again, it's not more than one. Amen? And so everybody has a gift in this particular category. And when it comes down to it, believers are also capable of operating in the manifestation gifts found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. The key to this is, as the Spirit wills. He's always looking for willing vessels. And God can choose to operate and flow through you in one of these particular gifts in this category at any given moment. It's nothing that you have to do to prepare. It's nothing that you, all you have to be is open and understand what it is that God is doing at that particular moment. Again, even when it came down to the interpretation of tongues, Brother Cool heard the interpretation in his head, but it wasn't clear about what to do with it. The reality of it is it wasn't something that he prayed for and said, God, give me this and things of that nature. It's just that the way the service was actually flowing, gifts in this category will get stirred up. Another thing, my mother saw this in operation on yesterday as well, because she said as time went on, it's almost like everybody had a word that needed to come forth. When you understand the gifts and how they operate, especially in this particular category, God will get to stir the atmosphere. There will be such a spirit of prophecy in the house that he will begin to use different people to profess a, a, a word, amen? And so when these gifts and when the spirit of God is moving, he can use any one of you at any given moment. He may use you in a particular gift in that category multiple times, or he may use you in, in it one time. But it's as the Spirit wills. And those particular gifts are the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And so when it comes to the fivefold ministry gifts, people often refer to them as titles or offices. Let me tell you something. I don't have time for wordplay. What you need to understand is what they do. Right. See, you got some folks, and I'm just being honest. We go back. We got some stuff in the church. Well, you know, it's not a title. It's an office. And you got some of it ain't an office. It's a title. Whatever. I don't care what the terminology is used. Understand what the gift does. Because that's what's important. And when you think about the words, they're also interchangeable if you look at the definition of those two different words, title versus offices. Title is a descriptive word or group of words attached to a person's name to show an honor, a rank, or an office. Amen? When you think about an office, the office is the duty, function, or part of a particular person. It is a position of authority, trust, or service. The bottom line is, it's a position in the body of Christ. It's a gift that God has given. You just need to be mindful or, 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 or be mindful of how it operates. Don't get caught up on the wordplay because you will hear that. And some individuals will go back and forth. I just need you to know that what makes the most difference when it comes down to a title or office is the work. Say the work. See, when it comes down to it, without your title or office being revealed, one should be able to identify what you are according to what you do. Right. See, if you understand these particular gifts, a person doesn't have to 
identified themselves or introduced themselves to you as this particular gift. Because when you understand them, you'll be able to say, oh, that's a prophet right there. Yep. And they have to say, I'm prophet so-and-so or prophet is so-and-so. When you understand it, you get close to people, you understand, oh, that's, that's, that's a pastor, that's a shepherd. So, you know, there's certain things that you should be able to see that will automatically give you understanding as to who they are. If you got a person that every time you turn around, they always trying to get somebody saved, who are they? Evangelist. They're an evangelist. I mean, they're not going to get deep in the teaching of the scriptures and things of that nature, but they want to know, do you know Jesus? Yeah. Are you saved? Have you been born again? You know, so when you see people operating in a certain way, without them telling you their title or office, you should be able to know because of what is evident, the work. Amen? And so, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, let us look at verses 7 through 8. Because uh, I want you to understand that the fivefold ministry gifts are also referred to as ascension gifts. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That word ascended means to go up or to rise up. Therefore, before he, talking about Jesus Christ, ascended to take his position on the right hand of the Father, before he ascended, he put some things in order here on earth for the church, amen? Before his departure. And so he put these things in order. So when you think about that, because in the body of Christ, you hear so many different things as it pertains to the gifts. I don't understand how we can sometimes read the same Bible, but get a totally different understanding. Because you have individuals that want to say that apostles no longer exist and neither do prophets. But if you look at this passage of scripture, when he ascended, he gave all five. Amen? Amen. When you think about it, some individuals like to say, and I ain't going to get deep into that until I get into that teaching, but they like to say, well, the only apostles was the 12. Well, what Bible are you reading? Because there were so many other apostles mentioned in the scripture outside of the 12. Hello? And so the bottom line is, he gave these gifts. He put these things in place before he ascended. Amen? People in the world today, they don't have a problem with a pastor. They easily accept that. People don't have a problem with the teacher. They don't have a problem with an evangelist. Oftentimes, individuals have a problem with an apostle or a prophet because they don't understand it. They don't understand it. And so you have many individuals that have been in the churches for years, but they don't have a clue as to what an apostle is. They don't have a clue as to what a prophet is. And the sad part about it, like my husband said, we are the evangelists. Nowadays, you know, individuals don't want to be an evangelist. Individuals don't want to be a teacher. Right. I said yesterday at the conference, I said, you know, the thing about it, it's almost like we make those gifts at the bottom of the totem pole. Oh, no, I don't want to be a teacher. No, I want to be an apostle. Or I want to be a prophet. I don't want to be an evangelist. When at one point in time, you had evangelists that was going strong. But then the church got to the point, because we like to put titles on certain uh, sexes, it got to the point at one time, evangelists were only women. Yeah. See, they may not have put you in a position of a pastor or something of that nature, but they will make you an evangelist. Amen? But when it comes down to it, all of these gifts are needed to be in operation in the church for it to function the way God wants it to function. And so because of our lack of understanding, sometimes it's easy for us to say, oh, no, those don't exist no more. Come up with all kinds of stuff to try to back it up. But this passage of Scripture is not hard to understand. And so when it comes down to it, the gifts in Ephesians 4.11 represent a work to be done in the body of Christ. When you understand they are not gifts given to men, meaning males only. He gave these gifts to men and women. And I'm sure some of you all probably say, well, the Bible I'm reading, they say he gave gifts to men, right? Well, I'm going to make it plain for you on today. 
Because sometimes in order to gain greater understanding of a text, you must sometimes refer to the original language in order to know what a word means. Because one word can have multiple meanings in the Bible. And so, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to show you two words, the term men and the term man, and I'm going to show you two different places where the same exact word is used in a sentence, but it is expressed differently. And the only way that you would know that is by going to the original language. And so Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at how man, M-A-N, is used in this particular passage of scripture. Amen? And so Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The word of God says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, what? Male and female, he created them. But when you go back to the first word in uh, verse 26, or so the first time you see the term M-A-N in that particular passage, if you were to go to your Strong's Concordance, it will lead you to number 120. And the Hebrew meaning for that particular word, M-A-N, where it says, let us make man, it is defined as a human being or the species of mankind. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. We're going to look at the word man in another verse of scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And it goes on to say, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. When you look up that word man in your Strong's Concordance, it will lead you to number 376, and it is defined as a male person. All right? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at the word men now in two different passages of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Spelled M-E-N. When you go to the Strongs, it will lead you to number 444. And the definition for that word men right there says a human being. And then you go to Acts. Go to Acts 25. We want to look at men in the scripture in Acts 25, verse 23. Acts 25, verse 23. And we just want to look at a passage of scripture where the term M-E-N is used. The same word, M-E-N, spelled the same way that's used in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Again, same word, different meanings. But you have to get to the original language to understand and so Acts 25, verse 23, the word of God says, So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, and Thetis command, Paul was brought in. Thetis command, when Paul was brought in. You see the word there, M-E-N. Guess what? When you go to the Strongs and look that up, it will lead you to number 435. And the definition that it gives is clearly, it says a male, and then it says a fellow sir. It's very clear. But if you don't understand that, you will listen to the foolishness that people try to tell you that a woman can't be an apostle, or a woman can't be a pastor, and things of this nature. He gave gifts to men, humankind, mankind, male, female. Because what you got to understand, it ain't about your sex. It's about the work. Amen. When you think about it, if I'm an evangelist, I don't care if I'm a male or a female, I should have the anointing to lead people to Christ. Amen. It shouldn't make a difference if I'm a 
male or a female if I have the gift to be able to teach people the word of God. But we get so caught up in some stupid stuff in the body of Christ because of ignorance and our inability to really study the scriptures to show ourselves approved. And because we done just heard somebody say something, we believe any and everything. Because we don't understand how things have changed since the Bible was written, you got to understand, yes, it may have been written from a male perspective, because guess what? It was written by men. Over 66 men wrote the book, wrote the Bible, inspired by God. When you understand even how things was in biblical times, women were treated as less than. But if you know anything about Jesus, he came on the scene and he changed things. First of all, he sat there at the well and talked to the Samaritan woman, and that was out of order according to the culture. See, sometimes you got to understand culture and why certain things are done. Yeah, Paul may have wrote in certain scriptures that a woman shouldn't say anything. She should be silent, but he was talking about unlearned women. But yet he highly recommended Priscilla and Aquila, who had a church in their house. So you got to understand the word of God, how it was written, and even how things have progressed. One thing about it, I don't care if you're a male or a female, if you unlearn, sit down somewhere. Hello. Go somewhere and sit down. Go somewhere and sit down. And so women were unlearned. They didn't have the privileges to go and gather with the men to learn about the word of God. But throughout the Bible, you have some sprinkles of some prominent women in the Bible. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so he gave gifts. Because God wants the work to be done through his people. He needs vessels to continue the work that he started. And so... When it comes down to it, we need to understand that Christ gave these gifts to the church for a purpose. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. And the word of God says, remember, he gave them for a purpose. And Ephesians 4, 11, it says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every, say every, every. by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. First of all, you have to understand that the fivefold ministry gifts or the ascension gifts have been given to the church to equip the people of God for the work of ministry. To equip means to prepare someone mentally for a particular task. One of the things you got to be prepared for through the five-fold ministry is to understand that your life ain't no longer your own. When you got saved, you're supposed to be about total surrender. It's about dying to self on a daily basis. Sometimes basis, sometimes somebody got to teach you how to die to yourself. Because guess what? Prior to Christ, it's always about us and what we want to do. But you got to understand, we got to be taught how to take on this assignment, we got to be equipped mentally for a particular task. To equip means to furnish someone with qualities necessary for performance. It means to prepare. And so, saints of God, we did not get saved just to go to heaven. It's one of the benefits of salvation. 
salvation, trust me, is something that we all look forward to, but we did not get saved just to go to heaven. How many of you understand that there is a work to do while you are still here on the earth? Because there are individuals that do not know Jesus Christ, and if they die without knowing him, they're going to hell. It's not God's desire that any should perish, but we have an assignment to get the truth out there to the world so individuals can become a part of the kingdom of God. We didn't get saved just to come to church. I'm so happy you're here today. I'm so happy that you make your way out on Bible study and things of that nature. But how many of y'all know we ain't get saved just to come to church? We got, we got saved and we come to church to get equipped to do our part in the kingdom. You come to learn what has God put inside of me that I need to use while here on this earth. Because each and every one of us have a purpose. And so each person has been given gifts and you need to be taught what they are and how to operate in them. I have been teaching on the gifts for a while. And the reality of it is, let's just say, even with your motivational gifts, if your gift is the gift of service and you don't understand it, then how you going to serve? If your gift is the gift of teaching, but you don't even understand your gift and how it operates, how you going to teach anybody? If your gift is the gift of giving and you don't understand that it extends beyond money, how you going to be able to do what you're supposed to do in the kingdom? And so often, people are in the church for years not doing what they're supposed to do because they are unlearned as to what it is that God has put on the inside of them. So you have the fivefold ministry that is in position to help give you a greater understanding of what's on the inside of you and to develop it so that you can be successful in what you're supposed to be doing in the kingdom of God. And so when you know what your gifts are, when you know what it is that you're supposed to be doing in the kingdom of God, it gives you the opportunity to do the work of the ministry. You got to understand, we are in position to equip you for the work of ministry, not to keep the chairs warm. Right. Not to come to church and show off how good you look today or whatever the case may be. We ain't even here to teach you how to dance. Amen? I know many people practice in the mirror and they got that thing down to a T. They'll run up to the front of the church because they want to let you see I'm good with this thing. But the bottom line is we ain't here to teach you how to do that. We're here to teach you how to do the work of the ministry. I'm going to get good with it one day. I'm going to practice. Y'all know I'll be at home. I'll be trying some time, right? Anyway. When it comes down to it, when you know what they are, you should look for opportunities to serve, meaning the work of the ministry. Use what he has given you. When you think about it, it is important that you use what the Lord has given you to encourage and strengthen the church. When the saints are equipped, the body of Christ will be edified. When it comes down to it, a major part of the work of ministry is the Great Commission. Come on now, the Great Commission. That is a part of discipleship. That is more than just saying, hey, can you come to church? That's more than just leading the person to Christ. How many of you know that there's a great work that takes place after that? Even when you think about it, those of you all that may be sitting on your teaching gifts, the reality, there's so many different areas in the body of Christ where teaching needs to go forth. Young people need to be taught on their levels. Teens need to be taught on their levels. You got the men that need to be taught on their issues. Women need to. There are so many different ways in the body of Christ where your gift can be in operation. It ain't about just standing here. And that's what we have to understand. God uses us all over the place. And so a major part of the work of the ministry of, work in the, of the work of ministry is the Great Commission. It involves preaching and teaching and healing and nurturing and giving and, and, and on and on and on. As again, again, being making disciples takes a lot of work. But we like to come to church. Hey, how you doing? See you. Yeah, that's it. And so the fivefold ministry gives our imposition also to help bring unity in our faith and to bring about an understanding of Jesus Christ, the Son of God.
God desires unity, which is oneness, not division. And there's too much division in the body of Christ. And I've said it before. If individuals are looking at us, the church, and we can't be on one accord, why would they want to even become a part? <laughs> and so God is trying to bring about unity. And the only way unity is really going to be brought in order is that there are people that are put in certain positions to call out stuff that ain't right, mm -hmm. to bring about true teaching and get rid of some of the false teaching, right. some of the stuff that, you know, your Baptist preacher from many, many years ago that never went to school, never learned anything, he just went on a feeling and taught and said what he thought sounded right and you believed it and you repeated it for centuries and centuries. Bottom line is some things got to be restored in the kingdom of God. So that unity and oneness can be on the throne. When it comes down to it, saints need to understand who Jesus Christ is. You need to understand why he even came to earth. You need to understand what he went through and why he went through it. Amen? And so you have to come and you have to be equipped by those that are in these positions. A lot of times people think, you know, I can just stay at home. I don't need to go to church. But guess what? The word of God is not set up for you to just sit at home. Because I can tell you one thing. I'm not making house calls like that. It's too many people in the world to make house calls to go and deal with everybody on an individual basis. That's why you come together collectively under one roof so that everybody can get the same word. I can sow one word to all of you. Amen. And what you do with the seed when it's sown, that's on you. The devil may snatch it immediately, but it's going to be sown. But when you think about it, individuals are not going to every single person one-on-one. -on -one. No. We come together. We assemble ourselves together. And we allow these gifts to be in operation so that we can receive what it is that we need to receive and understand. We need to know about Christ. The Bible is centered around the life of Christ and what he did for us. And we need to understand that. We need, if I was to ask somebody, well, tell me some, some more things that Jesus did besides dying on the cross. Because we need to know this stuff. Everybody can say he died, he was, he was crucified, he was buried, he resurrected, and he ascended. Well, can you tell me anything else? Can you tell me some of the things that he taught on the Sermon on the Mount? Because everything that he did, it was for a reason. He was given instructions all the time. But do you know more about Jesus except the crucifixion? And so you have to come to the house of God to receive that. And the fivefold ministry is here to give you that. The fivefold ministry gifts are in position to help mature the saints of God. God don't want us to constantly be immature. Y'all saw on last week as I was dealing with the subject of the word and we was dealing with some tests. The bottom line is God don't want you to be beige forever and you ain't going to be a beige forever because guess what? You eventually just move into the category of a common Christian if you never become a mature saint of God. But we're here to try to help you to be mature so that when somebody do say, what was the name of the fruit in the Bible? You won't ever put apple again. Hello? The devil is a bona fide liar. <laughs> I digressed. <laughs> I'm coming back. That's because I didn't check the test. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, when you think about it, the Lord puts the fivefold ministry uh, gifts in position because he don't want you to be immature. He wants you to be mature saints of God. He wants his people to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so when you are mature, you don't have to worry about being tossed to and fro. You don't have to be, worry about being blown about by every wind of doctrine of a of, of new teaching that comes out. Because every time you turn around, somebody coming up with new, a new something. You got new, 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 new age stuff that's coming out. You, you, you hear people say God, and you think y'all on the same play, page, but when you get a little closer and talk to them a little more, you understand. They talking about something that don't line up with this word right here. And so the bottom line is when you are mature and you are rooted and grounded and you listening to me and ain't sleeping in church, uh -huh. well. when you listening and your mind ain't wondering, when you listening and you ain't thinking about where you going to eat after church, if you're listening, I'm here, I'm here. then guess what? You will hear some foolishness and your spirit will be able to say, that ain't God. That ain't the word. Because I've been equipped, I've been trained, I've been taught by the fivefold ministry gifts that are in position to help me mature as a child of God. And so when it comes down to it, you won't be influenced when people 
people try to trick you with clever lies that sound like the truth. Right. Come on now, Satan is a deceiver. Don't y'all know that joke got to come right? He got to come correct. He got to come so close to the truth to try to twist you up. Because yep. it's going to sound good. But if you don't know that it ain't truth, you'll fall for the lies. Individuals are clever right now. Let me tell you something. You got new gospels that are being preached and everybody want to jump on this universal thing where everybody's saved. Yeah. It ain't about accepting Christ. Everybody going to heaven. That ain't in the word. You have individuals that literally, I'll never forget, you know, the well-known man from Azusa. I don't have to say his name, but, you know, he had a great uh, uh, connection with that. But he got on this great kick and started talking about hell ain't real. And they started having all these followers. The people, the, the, the leaders of the church, they came against them and things of that nature because they like, you are preaching some heresy up in here. We're not going for it. This thing is, I don't care. Left that position, started his own thing, and got his own followers that's now believing this mess that he's saying. The Bible talks about hell. How can you say it ain't real? But if you don't know the Bible and somebody come to you and say, well, you know what? You need to understand the God that we serve is such a loving God. There's no way that God, the creator of all people, will ever allow one of his created beings to spend eternity in a place of torment. Does that sound like a good God? And you get to think, you're right. A good God wouldn't do that. Guess what? A good God doesn't do it. People do it by the choices that they make. Oh, man. Right. If you go to hell, you send yourself there. Huh. By the choice that you made not to accept Christ as your Savior. He gave you the option, take the red pill or the blue pill, which one you want. Right. It's up to you. And so if you don't know this stuff, you'll fall for anything. And so he put individuals in position to try to help you. And so when the five-fold ministry gifts do their part and the saints do their part, because guess what? We got to do our part. You got to do your part. And when that happens, guess what? The result should be a whole body. Hello? A whole body joined together on one accord, working together, expanding the kingdom of God. And so the work of the five-fold ministry gift is major. It is not an easy assignment. That's why I don't know why people are so pressed to get here. See, everybody want to get here. want to be behind the pulpit. People don't understand the work that really goes into these particular offices. Y'all don't even understand the level of dying that you have to do. See, for real, some of the stuff that y'all do, I can't do and get away with it. Because there is a greater judgment for those of us that hold this position. There's a stricter judgment. Prime example, the children of Israel wanted to act like fools and cut up all the time, murmur and complain and sin and do all that other stuff. Moses, the leader of the people, got off track one time. And guess what? God said, where I was taking you, you ain't going. Come on, man, this life was over. I'm going to show you what you could have had. But because of your disobedience, you ain't even going to be able to experience I value the anointing that's on my life. And because I value the anointing that's on my life, and because I don't want God to ever take his anointing away from me, I don't want to be like King Saul, still in a position but not anointed. Wow. If you know anything about King Saul, God had already said, you know what, there's going to be another that's going to take your place. That's David. David was anointed as a king as a young boy. And eventually, King Saul was going to be one that was going to be out of the position. But when David was anointed immediately, he didn't step into the position. King Saul was still in position, but then it got to a point where King Saul made a decision to do something on his own, and guess what? The Lord anointing was removed from him, but guess what? He was still in position for years. My, my, my. Who wants to be in position, but yet the Lord is not with them? It's like that in a lot of individuals' lives because of choices that they've made. And when you're not really able to really see in the spirit, you still think they're on fire. You still think they're anointed. But God is saying, I ain't with them. Sometimes you look at some churches where the spirit of the Lord ain't even there no more. It's called Ichabod. He's no longer there. But yet they're coming through. They're having service. They're doing all this stuff to look holy and righteous. And God said, I ain't up in that camp. 
The spirit of the Lord is left. And so the bottom line is you have to value your anointing. I value this on my life. And so fivefold ministry leaders can't play with their anointing. It will affect your ability to lead effectively. And so the work of the fivefold ministry gifts is major. And we have to understand that the Lord desires a bride, meaning a church that is without spot or wrinkle, one that is holy and without blemish. And guess what? It's our assignment to try to get the church there where he can come back for that bride without spot or wrinkle that is really holy and without blemish. And so people, we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. We have to always understand that. And when you think about the fivefold ministry gifts and you try to get a greater understanding, when you think about natural soldiers, they have to be equipped for battle just like we do as spiritual soldiers. And so the fivefold ministry gifts are like the drill sergeants who train the believers to be mighty soldiers. And so the gifts of Ephesians chapter 4 are given by the Lord. They are appointed by God. God gives you the gift, but he will simply use men in the earth realm to affirm what he's already established in the heavens. See, individuals may desire to be a bishop, but guess what? That's not one of the fivefold anointed gifts that God has appointed. So a lot of people can't desire to be a bishop, and if they go through whatever rigorous training they have to do, they may, they may be uh, put in that position. Because guess what? A man can make you a bishop. Hello? A man can make you a bishop. Can't nobody make you a pastor. Can't nobody make you an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, or an evangelist. Because God is the one that gave the gift to you. You can't give it to nobody. And so what people do is they only affirm what has already been done in the heavenlies. Now, I know some people probably say, well, you know what? Something seemed to be off there. Because every time you turn around, we're making somebody something. And that's the problem. Stuff is off in the church today. We're making everybody, people go, I said this the other day too, I said, it's amazing. I said, we're in a day and age because the church goes through different waves. And it's always been like that. You had your season where everybody wanted to be a reverend. You had your season when everybody wanted to be a prophet or prophetess. Then you had, what's up, doc? You know, everybody wanted to be a doctor then. Everybody walking around with honorary doctorate degrees. I'm not against them and things of that nature, but it went to a point in time. Everybody became a doc, and most of them ain't go to school. Hello? And so everybody, what's up, doc? What's up, doc? Then next thing you know, everybody wanted, you know, we had the phase a while ago of an evangelist at one point in time. Then everybody wanted to be a bishop. You know the ways. Everybody bishop this, bishop that. So guess what? What is it today? Apostle. <laughs> Everybody's an apostle. <laughs> Was Brother Joe and Joe and so and so last week, and you woke up and two days later you Apostle Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> and so we in that day and age. And when you are truly called to a particular office because of all this mess you see, you don't even want to identify with it. Sometimes it's like, don't call me none of that. Just let my gifts speak for themselves. Yep. Everybody. Everybody is an apostle today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this to the camera. And for some of them, the only thing they can ever tell you about an apostle is that they are a sent one. And that's it. And you say, well, what is that? What are some of the characteristics of an apostle? What are some of the things that I should be able to see? And I'll get into that in the teaching. But for real, you got individuals that have these different titles. And you, you try to ask them, well, what does that mean? They can't even tell you. <laughs> so if you can't tell somebody else what your gift is, how are you walking in it? Wow. Hello. And for real, if God begins to reveal that you have a particular gift, then guess what? Learn about that gift. And then as you become competent in it, then walk in it. David was anointed king as a young boy, but he had to be processed. God had to deal with him and teach him 
some stuff to prepare him for the position. The reality of it is, when God started dealing with me about the office of an apostle, it was in 2009 and nobody knew about it. It ain't something that just came up. And honestly, at that time, I said, Lord, I need more understanding because I don't even understand it. When God first spoke to me about the office of a, a prophet, I had to get understanding. I know that like the back of my hands. No, walk in it strong. Don't have a problem with that. But then he wanted to shift some stuff. And I said, I need greater understanding. But when you have that understanding, you're able to walk confidently in what it is that God has given you, yes. not man. So again, God is the one that calls you, anoints you, and appoints you with one of these ministry gifts. He only uses a human being to affirm what he's done in the heavens. That's why I go many different places, people that don't know me, and they begin to speak about the gift that's on my life. All it is is a confirmation. That's what God will do. Now, boo-boo, <laughs> if you ain't got one confirmation, that's something just, just between you and God. And I would say more so just between you and you. Because <laughs> eventually, there's going to be individuals that are able to recognize what's on your life. And so God gives you the gifts. He will simply use men to affirm what he has done. And to affirm simply means to validate or confirm, meaning they don't give it to you. One thing about it, when you are sure who you are, I don't care if you, because in the church we have special services for everything. We have special services when you become a pastor, minister, deacon, different things of that nature. God bring about different giftings in you. My thing is, okay, if God reveals, do we always have to do something for every single gift that he reveals? See, one thing about it, I know who I am in Christ. Now, there are times when you will have individuals that have affirmation services or ordinations for different things. There's nothing wrong with that. But guess what? How many of y'all know if I never have an affirmation service, it ain't going to stop me from walking in my office? Because I know who I am in Christ. That's what we have to understand. It ain't about the pomp and the circumstances. I done had many a hands laid and spoken about about the anointing that's on my life. And so it ain't necessarily where we all got to come dressed up in the garb and all that other stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. It's nice. Please hear me. There's nothing wrong with that. When I license ministers and ordain individuals and do deacons, I do all of that. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. But what you have to know is when it comes down to these giftings here, when God reveals to you who you are, you walk in your assignment. You walk in your assignment. And eventually, God will use others to see what's on your life. And so, unfortunately, many in this day and hour of the church are given titles and offices that God has not appointed or anointed for them. And so, knowledge of the gifts and discernment will reveal what's God and what's man. And so, you will know who's who by what? Their fruit. You'll know who's who by their fruit. And so Jesus Christ functioned fully in every gift listed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. In Hebrews, it clearly, he's clearly listed as the apostle, amen, with a capital A. Anytime you see apostle written in the Bible, it may say Paul the apostle, it's never capitalized, amen. It's letting you know that Jesus Christ is the apostle, amen, just like he is the head. And so in Hebrews, he is clearly listed as the apostle and the high priest of our confession. When it comes down to it, he flows as a prophet. And you see that when he stands having a conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. When you look at John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14, it talks about the good shepherd. Amen. When you go back and you look at the word shepherd in the original language, it is translated to mean pastor. So he walked in that too. When it comes down to it, as the evangelist, he was a fisher of men. Everywhere he went, he said, come follow me. He began to teach them about himself. Amen. Because we need to tell people about Jesus. So he was a fisher of men teaching individuals about himself. And so every place that he went, every city and every village, he went preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And he was the teacher of teachers. Because if you look in the scriptures, you will see everywhere that he went, he was always teaching. 
And so he operated in them all. And so, when I told him the motivational gifts, as I bring this to a close, when I told him the motivational gifts, I identified each gift by a certain body part. I said the prophet was the eyes, service was the hands, teacher was the mind, the exhorter was the mouth, giving was arms extended, leading was the shoulders, mercy was the heart. And so there was a man named A.L. Gill that used a very descriptive uh, lesson to give you a greater understanding of the five-fold ministry using the hand and the fingers. Amen? And I'm going to share that in closing. The five-fold ministry is often likened to the human hand. The apostle is the thumb working with all the other fingers. Amen? The prophet is the point of finger saying, thus says the Lord. And it works closest with the apostle and the prophet. It works closest with the apostle. You got to understand, a lot of apostles and prophets or individuals, they actually flow in that. Usually, when it comes down to the fivefold, it's like, I operated as, in, in the, as an apostle and a prophet. I have the apostolic and the prophetic anointing. I keep telling you, I'm an apostle and a prophet that pastors a church. Please understand that. When you understand the shepherd, I'm, that's not my strong anointing. Do you understand that? When it comes down to an advantage, I know it's not my strong anointing. You learn what your strong gifts are. And so, again, you have the apostle that is the thumb working with all the fingers. The prophet is the point of finger saying, thus says the Lord, and works closest with the apostle. The center finger has the longest outreach, and it is what? Evangelist. Amen? The wedding ringer, I mean the wedding finger, <laughs> is the pastor. <laughs> that was a movie, right? Yeah. The wedding finger is the pastor, because the pastor married to the church. You know what I'm saying? They 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 in it on a whole nother level, amen. And so the wedding fit the wedding ring finger is the pastor symbolizing the special love relationship between him and his people. And the little finger is the teacher who works closely with the pastor and is much needed for balance. We need the balance. We need to be taught. We need all the gifts in operation. And so just as all the fingers are needed for a complete, well-working hand, all ministries are needed for the complete building up of the saints. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that was just my introduction. On next week, I will begin with the teaching of apostle. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I pray that you have been tuning in and been blessed by this teaching. Uh, please go to our website to find out more about us at www.mbttministries.com. Have a best and a wonderful day. Amen.